everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Stephanie, and today we are back with another dun dun month bag. Woo! Woo! Guys, I'm so excited because this is a long awaited video that I have been planning for months and months and months, and for some reason, my brain could not comprehend how to fill this in perfectly until today. Today, I decided to do it, and now this is one of the most satisfying things I've ever seen. So, today, we are going to be eating two large servings of a Japanese spicy cha cha secret menu from Jinya Ramen Did you say Bar. Cha -cha? Yeah. Cha like Cha Cha Ching, the restaurant just made so much money. <laughs> because what if it's just a regular ramen, but they charge you three more dollars and then put a secret menu on it? And LA idiots are like, secret menu? I want that. It was so yes. <laughs> so here we have two version or two large servings of it. It's got that pork chashu, which is like the broiled pork. We've got the pork broth. We've got bean sprouts. We've got this seasoned eggs that are just so melty milky. And then in the bento box, we have eight pieces of salmon cut roll six pieces of salmon nigiri, seaweed salad, six octopus takoyaki balls, and a Japanese... Mm -hmm. A Japanese... Um, Tonkatsu. Katsu. Yeah, a katsu. katsu? Okay. Yeah, a katsu. Sorry. Right. Okay, so I mean, I'm just gonna dig in because these eggs look so good. Let's take oh. all the noodles over there. Wow. Oh, oh, oh this hello. is so romantic. Give it to me. I'm just kidding. Okay, let me get the pork. Is it good? Is it good? Is it good? It's wow. funny because you used to not like Japanese ramen until I converted you. Yeah. True. Mm. It's just too thick, usually. That's yeah. weird. Then why are you dating me? <laughs> you know, it's weird when you laugh. <laughs> I know it's my joke, but... That's rude. Do we need kimchi down below? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll just go punch myself. <laughs> There's like seaweed salad. That's um... Um. What? That is so good. How do they make this? Holy cow. That is so good. Wow. Mm. So they charge you an extra one fifty for each egg. Mm hmm No wonder. Cha cha ching ramen bits. This is a good egg though. Yeah, but I don't know if I would ever I mean I did pay one fifty for mm -hmm. it, so That's really good. Mm hmm I'm gonna mix the wasabi. I can't believe it's like so perfect. Like a little soy sauce container. You look like it can you help me? Honey, get okay. it before they get all soaked in there. Okay. I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's just gonna be rice there. No. Oh my god. Exactly what happened. Mmm. Mm. Wow, this bento box really makes it taste better. Mm hmm. The setup of this makes it feel like so much cuter. We're in Tokyo today. Okay, okay, let's <laughs> calm it down. <laughs> Neither of us have ever been to Japan. If you guys have been, let us know. I heard it's like one of the best places to travel. Okay, I'm gonna bite into this. Mm. Mm. It's so good. Which one? The takoyaki balls. They have pretty big pieces of octopus inside. What do you see? It's really good. Wow. My goodness. Mm. We are just going to jump right into today's story because today's story is about a movie and this movie came out I want to say in June of last year on Netflix I think it's a Netflix original and a lot of people were confused by it it's a very heavy movie it's kind of one of those where the ambiance is it's a slow burn is kind of what I would categorize it as so it's based off of an Argentinian book and okay. it's dubbed over in English but you can actually watch it I think in Spanish um, I would say watch the subs 
it's always better than the dubbed over versions, but it's really, really intense. I guess I would rate it kind of similar to it does have that psychological thriller aspect of a lot of Spanish films that mm. I find so intriguing. I feel like American movies are just not that good with those small psychological thrillers that are just slightly gets mm -hmm. under your skin and then slowly makes its way into your brain, you know? Mm -hmm. Yuka has a lot of good ones. Oh, like, really? Oh, like yeah, the yeah, the Black Mirror, Mirror and all of those. But yeah. Have some other ones, yeah. Yeah, I feel like UK, Spain, I feel like Japan. Japan's good with horror. I feel like mm -hmm. the U.S. is like all action is amazing here, right? Korea is good with Parasite, <laughs> Oscar winning. I will tell you, we're good at a lot of other films. No, I know. That's what I'm saying. It's Oscar winning. Mm -hmm. And Japakiri. Japakuri! <laughs> oh, Japakuri. <I'm> <laughs> But this movie is in Spanish, but I believe it's more of an Argentinian movie. Mm -hmm. So not from Spain. And so today's movie is very interesting. It's called The Sun. And it has to deal with a lot of different disorders. And one of the first ones that we're going to be talking about is Capgrass Syndrome. Now, what Capgrass Syndrome is, is we've talked about it briefly before, but it's when someone truly believes that a loved one, a relative, a friend, possibly a spouse, has been replaced by an imposter. And this is one of the most heartbreaking syndromes that could ever occur to someone because it not only hurts and damages the person who is undergoing that, mm -hmm. but it's also hurting all of the ones around them imagine one day you wake up and you are still you af okay and you wake up and your husband does not believe that it's you and he won't show you any love he won't talk to you he's disgusted by you because he thinks you're a clone and you're like what are you talking about why would i be a clone and you start getting frustrated and he starts getting frustrated mm -hmm. and it's just a heartbreaking syndrome for everyone involved and don't worry it's not like a common thing it's pretty rare and it usually happens to people who already are suffering from schizophrenia dementia or alzheimer's because mm. you know that's when you already have somewhat of a warped version of reality in your head sometimes and so this movie kind of focuses on that but towards the end we will even touch up on man I always can't say it. Which is kind of the most famous case of this was Gypsy and her mom, Gypsy and Dee Dee, where yeah, the yeah. parent, you know, poisons their kid in order to get sympathy and makes who, the kid. Wait, who and had the syndrome? The kid? Yeah, no, the mother. The mother. Yeah, it's usually the caretaker tries to poison the kid to make them sick mm -hmm. and then brings them to hospitals and doctors can't really pinpoint why they're sick, what's going on. And usually the mom seems like this crazy, or it could be the dad, you know, seems like this crazy, just, I want to do everything to make my kid right. Like, please, you guys are missing something. Run more tests. They rack up crazy hospital bills. They're well known in the community. And, you know, it's a very interesting syndrome that's very, very scary. I thought it was just like she wants to give people sympathy and attention and money and all that kind of thing. So Yeah, so it's less money driven, which is weird. Because typically when you think of crime, you're like, mm -hmm. okay, well, let's just wrap our heads around it. It's sick and twisted and you would never do it. But, you know, for some reason saying somebody faked a kid's cancer for a GoFundMe sounds a lot more digestible than this mom made her kid sick so that she could get sympathy. Like that mm -hmm. sounds even more gross, yeah. but it's like that. It's like they just want sympathy because no matter how much money they get, the hospital bills that people with this syndrome rack up is insane Got because it. they love visiting hospitals and they love pushing crazy tests onto the kid because they're like, no, I know something's wrong with my kid. It's my motherly feeling. And it's even crazier because it's a hard time singling out these people because it's rare but on top of that they're so caring of the child and they're mm. trying to be as open as possible with the doctors that mm -hmm. the doctors almost feel like okay this is a crazy mom but at the same time this is her kid of course you know yeah. she's so it's just very intense so today's movie kind of talks about all of those things damn how, how do I do this do I cut it with a mm -hmm. knife yeah here you go. Oh. Wow. This has got to be one of the coolest knives. Linked in the description. It's black ceramic knives. And it was pretty cheap. Wow. Is it strong? Yeah, it's very trippy because it feels like plastic in my hand. 
And then you cut a finger off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like my fingers are in the plates now. <laughs> I freaking love it. This is gotta be one of the coolest knives. Yay! He never likes any of my Amazon purchases. He's just browsing. Just the browsing, you know what I mean? <laughs> just the browsing on Amazon. They're like, you know, products based off of your search history. They like recommend you shit, and then they recommend you more shit, and then more shit, and then eventually I ended up with a ceramic knife set that I didn't know that I needed. Oh my god, this is so good too. The food? Mm -hmm. Why does it look like this though? It's like it's like ground. potato and meat. Mm -hmm. That's so different. Wow, oh my great. god, no, this is not a katsu, it's a cro croquette. Mmm. Mm. So good. So today's <laughs> story, today's movie. Now, immediately when I say this, a bunch of y'all nasties are going to go and watch the movie. Because it opens up with a very sexual scene of a couple doing it. Immediately right off the bat, even though there is no talking, you know that they are trying to conceive a baby because of her positioning afterwards. After the fact of this fun stuff that they do. So apparently when you're trying to get pregnant after you... Got Why it. am I 12? I'm like, after you like show each other some affection, the woman flips over so that... Do got your own it. research, okay? <laughs> got it, got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, immediately right off the bat that you don't know if these are, you know, if they're just dating, if they're married, but they're trying to conceive a baby together. Mm -hmm. And then he gets off and he says, you know what, do you mind if I go work? And she's laying in bed and she says, no, it's fine. And that's when you find out that the main character, mm -hmm. whose name is Lorenzo, he is an artist and he has this giant living room where he just has tarp all over the ground and he likes to do art in a very particular fashion, which is not just, you know, like a Bob Ross kind of painting. It's one of those where he likes to splatter the paint, use his hands, use random tools, do like drip paints and stuff. And so he's doing all of that to classical music because again, this is a psychological thriller and that's how you get psychologically fucked. It's classical music, okay? <laughs> and so he's doing all this to classical music and then she comes out and she's watching him paint and she says, you know what, I'd like to stay home tonight. And he's like, no, you have to come to this party with me. You know I'm not close with my friends anymore. Please, 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 it'll be so awkward. And so they show up to this very, very bougie house and this man opens the door. Now, the man is a close friend of Lorenzo's, but it seemed that they might have had a falling out. Mm -hmm. And immediately you're introduced to a woman by, by the name of Julieta. Now, Julieta is very different from the woman that we just met who is dating Lorenzo. Mm -hmm. She seems like a lot more fun. She seems Seems like a lot more, you know, just out there, bubbly, outgoing, and Sigrid, which is the name of the woman, mm -hmm. she is very, very reserved, right? And mm -hmm. this is when you start to notice, okay, maybe Lorenzo and Julieta had a thing because they seem very comfortable around each other. They seem kind of flirtatious, even in front of Sigrid, and it just makes you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you start talking, and they just, this is when they start really just opening up about details. You know, Lorenzo has a lot of paintings that are hanging up in this house, and she's mm -hmm. dating the, the dude that Lorenzo used to be friends with. I forget his name. Let's call him, like, Ron. That's, like, not a Spanish name at all, but, like, Ron, okay? She's dating him now. She used to be a student of Lorenzo's in an art seminar, but now she's an attorney mm -hmm. and she does a lot of criminal defense and they start talking and, you know, Sigrid opens up and says, you know, I we're trying to have a baby. And immediately it seems that the friends are kind of like, oh, you guys are trying to have a baby? Oh, okay. And so they seem like they're happy for them, but maybe not so much, maybe not too much. And you start to question why. Yeah. And you find out that he already has two daughters that he's estranged from. He has no connection with them. It seems that his first wife has taken them and he doesn't really try to hang out with them, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so from that, it seems maybe there's a little bit of tension. You mm -hmm. also find out that Sigrid, the one that Lorenzo's dating, is a biologist. And she moved to Argentina to do this crazy research study and she has this studio inside of their apartment that she's just turned into like this crazy biology lab and she's really smart and incredibly talented you know and you start seeing why Lorenzo would fall in love with her mm -hmm. Do you think it's hard to date like an artistic type? I'm an artist. It's hard to date, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like 
I would say they're normal people. No. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Know. I think it'd be hard to date someone who, for me personally, because of my personality, that um looks deeply into things. Um. Uh, right. Yeah. I think that would be really difficult. Oh my gosh, these noodles are so hard to grasp. So good. Now at this point, this is when you have a sudden flash forward. And you know it's a flash forward because it gets very intriguing. And it's the fact that <laughs> Lorenzo's in jail. And the police officer open up his little jail cell, open up the prison doors, and Julieta comes, and she's an attorney, like we remember just from the last scene. Yeah. And she says, what have you done? And they get to sit down because, you know, you have the right to an attorney, and they start talking, and he says, promise me right after I get out, we will press charges on her. And you don't know who her is. And Julieta mm -hmm. sits there and goes, are you insane, Lorenzo? You're the one that's been arrested. She's pressing charges against you. This is very serious. Please uh -huh. don't ever repeat that story to anyone. Okay. And so you never really know what story they're talking about. And so you start thinking, okay, who is she? What yeah. happened? It must be sacred. And so then it cuts to a scene of Lorenzo's art gallery opening. He was having a little exhibition and he had all of these paintings in a gallery wall. And the friend that Julieta is dating is actually an art broker. And so they're all kind of in the same scene. And uh, all these waiters are passing out food. It's a very fancy event. And Lorenzo's nervous. It seemed that he has kind of taken a little bit of a break from art and he hasn't created anything that he's been proud of in such a long time. And so he's like, oh, no one's coming. It's This is it. Like, there's like four strangers in here. Nobody's showing showing up, nobody's gonna buy the art, and Sigrid's there, and she's trying to be supportive, and she keeps telling the waiters, bring more food, bring more food, and he keeps being like, no, what's the point, nobody's showing up, and immediately, Julieta shows up, and she, you know, hugs the both of them, and they start talking, and they start walking together, except Sigrid runs off to, like, I don't know, go get some food, mm -hmm. and so Julieta and Lorenzo are walking around the art gallery, and they start opening up, and this is where you get a little bit alarmed, because it starts to take a turn that you weren't expecting, which is that Lorenzo's kind of a sleaze, and he starts talking about, you know, how the friend looks very happy because Julieta is talented. It seems that they hooked up in the past, etc., etc. You realize that they had feelings for each other and Sigrid's calling. He's not picking up the phone. And a waiter walks by with a plate of spoonfuls of soup and sardines on top. And it just looks very intense. And so they're staring at it and she's like, well who made that? And he's like, well, Sigrid made it. My wife made it. She's very excited about the gallery opening. And she's like, oh. And he's like, please, tr have one. And she's like, no, I'm good. And he's like, I had it. She's like, yeah, because that's your wife's cooking. You have to have it. I don't have to eat it, you know. And they start kind of making fun at her cooking. And it looked pretty bad, okay? Not as bad as mine, but it looked pretty bad. And so <laughs> at this point, a waiter walks up to them again and says, hey, listen, hey, Lorenzo, I think your wife needs you. She's said she called you you're not picking up so he's like okay i wonder what happened rushes to the little kitchen in the gallery and she's sitting there and she says i have to go home i have to go home right now lorenzo and he's like why what's wrong with you uh -huh. she's like well i'm pregnant what and so immediately okay. lorenzo's so excited mm -hmm. and he's like oh my god like did you, how did you did, did you just find out how do you know like did you bring a test to the gallery like what do you mean like in the middle of my gallery opening you found out that you're pregnant like that's very random right you peed on a stick just now and she's like no i actually knew for a couple weeks but because last time i had a miscarriage i wanted to make sure this time so then that's when you're kind of you know getting into the idea of okay they've had trouble conceiving in the past etc and so up until this point like i said you have so much much normalness being involved except for the fact that they keep doing these flash forwards to different parts in Lorenzo's life and the next flash forward of him is in a psychiatric hospital where a doctor diagnoses him with Capgras syndrome meaning that he feels like someone has been replaced by a clone and you 
don't know who that person is. You don't know what mm. they're talking about. You're just like, okay, did he think Secret has been replaced by a clone? Like, what's mm-hmm. going on? Like, and is it an imposter? What's going on? And so then it flashes forward again to Secret's pregnancy, right? She's mm-hmm. pregnant and they're at the hospital with a sonogram. And the doctor's asking, do you guys want to know the gender of your baby? And they're like, no, it's fine. And they get down to the consultation and the doctor says, okay, well, in a couple weeks, it's about time for you to get all these tests done. And she goes, no, I already know. I already did all the tests because I didn't want to wait. Doctors don't normally do tests early, but I've had a miscarriage, so I want to be very, very careful. And she said, I did all the tests at home. And the doctor's like, are you a doctor? Mm -hmm. And Lorenzo's like, no, she's a biologist. She wanted to make sure all the tests were done in her lab. And so she goes, yeah, anyways, I have a blood clotting problem, which means I need to take this sort of medicine. Otherwise, it might be too late and I need it now. And the doctor says, well, we can't just do that. We need to run the test. And also, I'm afraid it's too early on in your pregnancy for us to determine that you need those tests right now. Maybe in like a week or two, we can, you know, try to see if anything's happening. And she says, a week or two will be too late. Anyways, thank you. And she says, I'll be waiting outside. And she walks outside. And then the doctor's sitting there with Lorenzo. And the doctor goes, well, do you want to know the gender of the baby? Mm -hmm. And Lorenzo goes, it's a boy. This is the third doctor's visit we've had. So it seemed that she's been going doctor to doctor, whether she's very paranoid health reasons or maybe she wanted this medicine we don't exactly know what and so that is it's so weird so why so she, doctor to doctor to make sure the baby is okay or it seems like it and she wants some sort of medicine very badly it seems mm. okay but i'm sure there's like a ton of protocol you know Mm-hmm. so Obviously, they already know the gender, so they're pretty Mm -hmm. over it. Yeah. (laughs) And what did the doctor say? Just so shocked. Oh. Yeah. He's like, surprise, it's a girl. (laughs) (laughs) Now, increasingly, you'll realize that their relationship gets kind of broken apart by her pregnancy. She starts becoming increasingly paranoid. She wants nothing in the house that could contain any sort of toxin. You know, he paints in the living room. She gets offended. She says, this paint is making me sick. He's like, no, there's no lead or toxins in the paint. Like, I'm positive. And she's like, I don't care. Just don't do it in the middle of the room. Go into the attic or something. And so he's a little bit annoyed, but whatever. Like, she had a miscarriage. He's trying to be very understanding. And so he goes into the attic, you know, and they're talking about all these home births. She wants to have a baby at home. She doesn't like hospitals. She doesn't want to be in a hospital, etc., etc. And he's just kind of feeling like he's not, he has no power over anything. Like mm-hmm. it's, yes, we wanted this baby together, but now I can't have any sort of input about the baby. And so he's like, whatever. And you see him start to slowly paint this nursery into beautiful colors. And it's actually very pretty. I was like, God damn, I might take a picture and make that my nursery. All of a sudden, he walks downstairs from cutting his hand open by accidentally opening the paint canisters with a screwdriver. And there's suddenly a Norwegian lady, just an old old Norwegian lady sitting in their living room and he's like what the hell is happening is this a home invasion and okay. the wife comes out and she's Norwegian and she moved to Argentina for work and she said this is my nanny she gave birth to me she raised me she flew here from Europe and she's gonna stay with us until I deliver the baby mm-hmm. and so he's like well you could have at least told me that we're gonna have some old lady staying with us for mm-hmm. months but cool and so she's like it's fine it's fine and increasingly you see more and more tension build up between this couple but it's all kind of under the disguise of just a stressful pregnancy that's the weird part you'll watch this movie and you'll slowly somehow relate to sacred in a certain aspect in the fact that like yes you have the right to be paranoid if you suffered a loss but at the same time it's just like Ooh, is she a little too paranoid? And I wonder how that's going to affect the kid once the kid's born because you Mm -hmm. still want your kid to be a kid. And so at that point, you see him go into her lab to fix up his little hand cut that he had. Mm -hmm. And he goes in there alone and it's a very high tech looking lab. Mm -hmm. And he goes down there and he's alarmed because you see all of these books. Now they're in a different language, so the titles of them aren't very clear, Mm -hmm. but it looks like just a bunch of pictures of embryos, which are like before the baby becomes a baby. And so he's a little bit concerned. So in it seems, he doesn't say it, but to the viewer, it almost seems like, is he concerned that maybe that baby isn't a real baby? 
Or is he concerned that his wife is so paranoid to the point where she's like reading everything, even bio- biology books on babies right now? Like oh, that's he just, her lab. Mm-hmm. Oh, so it's very it. hard to decipher. He just looks very, very alarmed. And so you're just kind of looking at this like, I wonder what's going on. And so he goes back into his little art studio. And now it's in the attic and he has this clear view to their backyard. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden he sees his wife sit down with her pregnant belly Mm -hmm. and she has little medicine next to her and she opens it up and Mm -hmm. lifts up her shirt so her belly is in full view Mm -hmm. and he grabs a shotgun and you're very alarmed all of a sudden she grabbed a shot no he did what yeah until you realize that there's a scope yeah Yeah. yeah, yeah. and then you're like what the what is this music about right and so he uses the scope to look into it and he sees that she's using a syringe to inject something into her stomach. And again, it's very confusing. It just doesn't make any sense. So he immediately puts the shotgun down, runs downstairs, and from the upstairs view, you see them kind of arguing. He's like, what the hell are you doing? And she's like, I care about this baby. I will never let anything happen to it, etc." More and more tension. She's not leaving the house. She's only eating like this weird placenta looking thing that the Norwegian nanny is giving her. She is very intense about the situation of the home. And then finally, one day when his hand heals, he decides to go back into the nursery to finish painting it up. And he realizes it's just been overpainted by a solid light blue color. And he worked really hard on it. What? He was trying to do some kind of artwork. Mm-hmm. So the, was the mom trying to ingest something into the baby? It seemed that she probably illegally got or somehow made the medicine she was asking the doctors for. And do you know what that medicine is for? I think it's just to prevent blood clotting. But who knows if that's what she injected. Um, because she's so afraid that something will happen. Uh, so this story is very open-ended at so the end. So you're assuming what's happening. Mm-hmm. Got it. It's one of those movies that have like four different variations of possible theories. You know, increasingly things start getting worse. The nursery is painted over. He gets angry, visibly angry, and understandably so. And so he shows up to Sigrid in the little kitchen and he's like, what the hell? Like, what happened to the nursery? Yeah. And she's like, listen, you know that the baby isn't supposed to have any stimulus. That's too much stimuli in the room, right? It needs to be a light, neutral color that's not too bright. Everything is overwhelming for a baby. And to him, he starts getting frustrated. And there's a lot of points in the relationship where he starts talking about, like, it's just a baby. Like, yes they're fragile but i've had two daughters they're perfectly healthy like it's they're not that fragile she starts taking low digs at him saying well how are your daughters doing now knowing that they don't talk to each other and so it just seems like they are not having a healthy relationship but Mm -hmm. then randomly you'll see the wife come up to lorenzo and be like you know honey i know i'm being paranoid right now but i'll be better once the baby's born and so you're thinking okay maybe we should cut her some slack maybe she has some ptsd okay Mm -hmm. we're all gonna cut her some slack until one day he wakes up in the middle of the night and at this point it seems like the entire nine months of the pregnancy have passed Mm -hmm. and he wakes up his wife's not in bed Mm -hmm. and so he puts the blanket down and he sees this giant wet spot on the bed oh shoot and so he starts looking for her secret secret and he hears her in a different bathroom so he starts knocking on the bathroom door because it's locked and she's screaming and the norwegian nannies there screaming something in norwegian and it seems that she's about to give birth and so he's like let me in let me in Mm-hmm. And she won't let him in. And so he starts feeling like, what the fuck is going on? Which is very strange because, I don't know. I feel like when I first met you, I was like, oh, I don't want you to see me giving birth because like I heard you poop, you know? But then now I'm like, yeah, I know you're going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> you better be there and hold my hand. Mm-hmm. And so he waits outside and he falls asleep outside the bathroom door. And finally, the Norwegian nanny opens the door and he's allowed in. Mm-hmm. And she's just kind of peacefully standing with the baby. Just everything seems healthy. She's and standing? Good. Yeah, and she's everything seems fine. And so he gets to hug the baby. And then another flash forward okay. of him talking to a judge. And the judge says, you know, this is your second act of violence not that simple we don't believe you and you're like what do you mean violent why is he violent so Mm -hmm. now what we've gathered is that the psychiatrist says that he has capgrass syndrome which means that he thinks one of his loved ones has an imposter or is replaced by an imposter and then secondly that he's had a violent episode of some sort but now this is the second one Mm mm-hmm hmm so you think the fact that she 
deliver the baby without him made him feel some type of way. Mm hmm. But or, I think it's just not just that, it's like everything. Like,、mm-hmm. she made all of these decisions without him. That's very weird. Mm hmm. And it seems like the Norwegian nanny is very controlling. Oh.、Uh. So, you think all of this was caused by the pregnancy or something else already in them? Maybe already in them. I feel like I wouldn't want, like, an. No offense. I don't think I'd want, like, a, like an older person to help me through my pregnancy. Because I feel like they're gonna just make my life so hard. Like, I feel like a lot of Korean old midwives, I guess you could call them, that help you, like, deliver babies. And then、mm-hmm. even, in, I don't know if it's just Korean culture. I feel like maybe Chinese culture too.、Oh, yeah. In Korean culture, a month after you have your baby, you're not allowed to leave your house. And they only eat, like, certain foods, you know?、Mm-hmm. I feel like that's a little crazy. I mean, I wanna be safe, but I also don't wanna be so crazy that, like, I know a lot of Koreans, they'll, like, give up their dogs when the wife gets pregnant. I'm、oh, like,、yeah. excuse you, I ain't trading no bits for no other bits, okay? I'm keeping all my bits. I'm gonna keep my dogs and I'm gonna have a baby too, okay? I can do it all, it's 2020. Yeah. <laughs> and so,、um, yeah, no, the Norwegian lady seems really, really controlling. And so you start getting intrigued by what is this going, like, what's going on? And what's gonna happen once the baby's born? Is she Gonna let loose? Is the Norwegian lady gonna leave? But none of that happens. It seems that it, it, the situation just gets more and more tense. And what's creepy is you don't see the tension build. You really just see lots of different parts of Lorenzo. So the next scene will cut to him and the two friends, Julietta and the dude, the art broker,、mm-hmm. they visit their house. Mm-hmm. The one that Lorenzo lives in. And the first thing they ask is, like, Oh, are you guys remodeling? And up until this point, you, did, you never saw such a big view of the house. And suddenly they have like these light blocking colored like shields on the windows. And he's like, No, we're not doing any remodeling. And so the friends look confused. Wait, they're covered, they, cu- they tape、yeah. up their windows? Yeah.、Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Julietta, she's like, Well, I, I brought you this gift、mm-hmm. for the baby. It's our first time seeing the baby. And he's like, Well, thank you. And he opens it up, and it's a little baby shirt. And he says, Well, I don't know if Sigurd's going to like this because it's not 100% cotton. And so the friends are like, Okay. <sighs> and so they get seated in the living room. Lorenzo brings them coffee, and it cuts to a scene of them just alone and on their phones. And the friend is like, Can we go home now? And Julietta's like, No, just wait a couple more minutes. And、uh-huh. he's like, We did our duty. We came here. We said hi. We gave them a gift. We drank coffee. Let's go home. Home. And she's like, just wait a couple more minutes. And suddenly Lorenzo comes out and he says, Listen, I've been going insane. She and the baby have not left the house in six months. You guys are the first people that were allowed into the home. I only get to see my son four times a day. We put all these window blockers on because apparently the son is like allergic to, like, I don't know, and has a light sensitivity. And it just becomes very, very creepy. That is so freaking eerie. Yeah. And the, the, Friends are like, it's fine, like, we don't want to bother you. We'll come back another time. They're just trying to leave.、Yeah. And he's like, no, you have to meet them. So they haven't seen the baby yet. Yeah. The so, wife wouldn't come、yeah. out with the baby. And so he's like, I'm going to go get her. And you hear some like arguing in the background, and suddenly she appears with the baby.、Mm-hmm. And she seems happy. And you know, the friends walk on over and they go, oh, hello, what's your name? Oh, Henrik is the name of the baby. Oh, cute, cute. And it gets awkward because that's the moment where you would normally tell your friend, like, Do you want to hold him? You、mm-hmm. know, the baby's six months old. The baby、mm-hmm. looks healthy. They're inside of a controlled environment. Is that you know? what it is? Yeah. And so they're just kind of like standing around. And she goes, Okay. And just holds the baby. She said, Okay. Yeah. And so then the friends are like, Yeah, well, you seem busy. So we'll just, yeah, we're just glad we could see you.、Um, we're going to go now, right? And she just goes, Okay. And then she just walks away with the baby. And it gets just so strange. Now it cuts to more scenes of them throughout the day of just having this baby ruining their relationship, not because the baby was hard work, but because Lorenzo was not even able to help with the baby. The baby starts crying one day. And, and Lorenzo, the nanny's still there. Yeah, the nanny's still there. They don't have a pediatrician, they don't even go to the hospital. What? And so at this point, you know, he's like, listen, we need to take our kids to the hospital. He has a fever. He's had a fever all day. I don't know what's wrong with you. Whatever you're doing and your stupid ass nanny is doing is not working. This kid needs a proper doctor. And so he's getting riled up and, you know, the relationship's falling apart. She's like, you don't know what the f 
my baby needs, blah, 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 blah. And it just turns into a massive fight. And then finally, he's had enough. The baby won't stop crying. The baby has a fever. And so he swoops up the baby and he's about to walk outside the door when Sigrid appears and is like, where the hell are you going with the baby? And he just pushes her off because she tried to scratch him on the neck. And so Uh he pushes her and she bangs her head on the floor. And he rushes out to the nearest emergency room. Now this is where it gets really intense. You have this man in his art clothing. So he's battered in paint, holding his son, and he meets a doctor. Now the doctor is like, it's just a small fever. It's fine. You know, it should be able to come down on its own. And the doctor is like, well, who's your pediatrician? Uh We don't have one. Okay, well, are they allergic to any medicine just in case I prescribe something? We, we don't know. You don't know? No, I don't think so. We never had like an allergy test and I don't, we don't have a pediatrician. And so then the doctor sees him and it zooms up to the marks oh. on his neck and the doctor goes, Okay, well, you look a little banged up. Why don't we help you out? You know, um, we can probably heal this. Why don't you give me the baby? And... We're going to patch you up and then you'll be on your merry way. And immediately you can sense the doctor is like, this baby might be kidnapped. So the doctor freaks out, calls the police immediately because he rushes out with the baby. He's like, no thanks. And he rushes out. Uh And you see a bunch of police cars pull up, but he rushes past them. And he's able to make it back home when right in front of the house, Sigrid is waiting with police officers. And so then he goes up to Sigrid and goes, look, I told you it's nothing bad. He just has a fever. We just needed to go to a doctor. She grabs the baby, rushes inside the door, and he's about to go go in when the officers stop him Uh and they say listen you have a restraining order on you right now because she said that you hit her you beat her you attacked her to take your pay to take the baby he's like what are you talking about and they're like well you're not allowed in your home like this is a domestic abuse call like we're not letting you back into your home with your wife and child and based on what just based a report yeah Wow. Mm-hmm. And this is where it gets interesting because at this point, he's not allowed to go home. And so he makes it over to his friends and Julieta's house. Now, Julieta is an attorney. So they start talking about all the things that are happening. And Sigrid has filed for divorce. And on top of that, she has a 90-day restraining order. That means he cannot see the child or Sigrid for the next 90 days. Mm-hmm. And so for the next three months, you see him kind of living at this friend's house. And finally, after three months, he comes out with a bag to his friends. And it's, it has a little toy that he made for the son in it, right? And mm-hmm. he says, I'm so excited. I finally get to go see my son. Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, well, that's good. And he's like, I got my own apartment. So now I'm sure I'll get, you know, shared custody, etc., cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And he makes it on over to their house that he shared with Sigrid. And he goes inside and the little boy is watching TV. Uh-huh. And Sigrid is nowhere to be found. The nanny opens the door. And so he walks over to the boy and puts the bag down mm-hmm. and brings out a little toy. And says, here you go. And you never see the boy's face. Mm-hmm. But you see him, and he's alarmed. And Uh he immediately starts screaming at the nanny, That's not my son. Where's my son? That's not my son. Where's my son? What? And the nanny's getting confused, and it's all like a little too much, you know? Where's my son? Where's my son? And he starts searching around the house, in all the rooms, the nursery, the kitchen, and the nanny's calling the police while she's chasing after him. And finally, he makes it down to the little lab that the mom's probably in right now, and he believes that the real son is in there, because that's an imposter. And so he's about to, he's banging on the door, he's screaming, and then it cuts to police slamming him up against that door before it opens, and putting him in handcuffs. And that was the second arrest. And so after that, he gets released. And Julieta, at this point, his friend, his lawyer, is very, very upset because she's like, what are you talking about? Are you drinking again? And so it seems that maybe he had a drinking problem. We don't know. Everything about this is just so confusing, okay? And so then you see him released from jail and he's like, you know what? I'm going to get it together this time. And he's walking around when he walks to a nursery. Now, it's a daycare, and they have this big window, and the window is open so he can talk to people inside, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of little kids on the ground, and there's two teachers, and he's just staring inside. And one of the teachers notices, goes to the window, and says, Sir, can we help you? Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, um, I'm Henrik's uncle. I just I just wanted to um, see Henrik. And she's like, well, you can't come in unless, you know, we have permission you're not on the list uh-huh. and he's like yeah i'm just his uncle i just want to i just want to see him i was walking by and she's like um and she seems very hesitant uh-huh. and so then he pushes her more and goes can you just bring him out like i just want to say hi I, i'm not going to come inside i just want to say hi and she looks very scared uh-huh. and she goes he's sitting right there and pointed right at the baby right there that was in view and he looks alarmed because he doesn't recognize his own son so is this the same son that he saw at the house or we don't know okay 
And so then the lady shuts the window and presumably calls the police. Oh, boy. And so he ends up in prison again. Again? <laughs> yeah, and then he's released again, yeah. And so it all gets really complicated, and he's just trying to get custody of his son. He doesn't know what's going on. He has his new apartment, and he's trying to do some artwork. It's not working. He just he wants to see his son. He doesn't understand what's going on. And then finally, they get a call from the attorney that works for the wife. And uh -huh. she said, you know what? I think we're prepared to do shared custody. Even though you weren't expecting it, we just want you to be present in your son's life. Like it's important for the son to grow up with the dad. Yeah. And so they have a mediation, like um, where all the attorneys show up, there's person writing up a contract and they're all talking, they're all negotiating. Yeah. And the biggest negotiation is that the mom wanted to share custody so long as she had privileges to fly the kid out of the country. Because she said, I want, you know, to go visit my parents in Europe and I want to take Henrik. Uh-huh. You know, and everyone's like, no, that's, no, we don't want that. We don't want that at all. They don't want Henry to leave the country. Yeah, because okay. what if they don't come back? Got it. Who's going to go look after them? Nobody. Uh -huh. And so at this point, Julieta is like, don't take the deal. Don't take it. But he says, I need to see my son. I just want to see my son. I'll do whatever it takes. And so they finally sound, they finally sign off on a custody agreement. And he said, as long as I get to see my son tomorrow, I will sign off on this. Mm -hmm. and so they sign. And the next day arrives mm -hmm. and he's going to go pick up his son from the house that they used to share together. Yeah. And he walks in and it does all these zoom ups on the house. And you start seeing these big like HVAC is I don't know if that's what you call it. HVAC, like those intense air, ster air sterili sterilizers, air purifiers, all hooked up into the townhouse. Like it looks like she is very paranoid of germs inside the house. It's just very strange. All of this is very strange because you see that and then you're like then why would that same type of mom leave her son at a daycare where he's just rolling around in other people's saliva you know it just yeah. doesn't make any sense and so he goes in and the nurse or the nanny gives him Henrik and he goes into the car and they drive to Julieta's place yeah. and so the two couple they're playing with the baby and wait a minute so this time it is his son now I don't know he just he took the it? son and then brought it to Julieta and the friend's place and the friend and Julieta are playing with the baby and he says this is making me emotional. I'm going to go use the restroom. Yeah. And so he leaves, but he doesn't go to the restroom. He leaves the entire house and you see him in a car angrily driving to his town home. He breaks in to the little biology lab inside their house, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit where you see a crib in there. Which is normal. I mean, lots of people have cribs all over their house. Because if you're working in one room, you probably put a crib in your office. And he sees a crib and he walks over and you don't really see what's in the crib. But you see him saying something to the effect of, my son. And then Sigurd appears with that shotgun from earlier and kills him. What? And at this point, nobody really knows. The friends who are taking care of Henrik at their house, they realize, wait a second, it's been like an hour, is he still pooping? And yeah. so they go to the restroom and they knock on the door, he's not there, his car is missing. So they freak out and they rush on over. To the townhouse. Yeah, they rush on over to the townhouse. And they're thinking about, okay, should we just drop off Henrik with the mom? Because it looks like he's on a bender. So before they drive on over to the townhouse, they stop by his apartment. Uh -huh. Maybe he's there, maybe something weird's going on. Yeah. They unlock the apartment with a spare key yeah. and inside you just see so much artwork of like faces of a young boy's face but it's graft up too so it looks like you know it was done in a graft to do like symmetricalness and all these things and Whoa. there was two babies it was two different looking babies so some the viewer might think is one of it his son and then the other one's not his son yeah. what's going on yeah. and so they immediately realize okay maybe this guy's drinking again this is not normal art this is kind of creepy and so they rush on over to the townhouse where Sigrid and Lorenzo used to live and she walks on over no one's opening the door uh -huh. she sees that a little like a baby basement window uh -huh. is open and so she goes and looks and it's looking straight into the lab oh, boy. and you see her start to freak out and she rushes back to the car and then the scene cuts to her in the lab and there's a bunch cuts of police to officer who in the lab um julietta oh okay in the lab and there's a bunch of police officers because he had been murdered and there's no sign of secret and there's no sign of the nanny okay. and the police said well we have to take their son to the orphanage and she goes well no we're their godparents like we can keep them it's fine yeah. they're like okay we'll just we'll try to get it approved by a judge right then it just cuts to them having a life the friend and julietta just 
raising this kid together,、uh-huh. and they decide to go overseas for a vacation one day. She, Julieta, sees the nanny buying some food、oh, overseas,、okay. and so she immediately recognizes the nanny and rushes to follow the nanny. Uh-huh. And the nanny drives and walks to this little secluded house. Yeah. And so she's slowly walking in, and again she sees a window, and she peers through it, and you can hear Sigrid talking, and you can hear a baby crying, but nobody shows that to you. You just see Julieta start to cry, looking through the window. Cry. And that's how it ends, because whose baby does she have? Because Sigrid has a baby. So whose baby、yeah. is Juliet taking care of? Nobody knows. That's how the movie ends. And so the there's a lot of interpretations of the ending, right? Okay. Which is where it gets interesting. Because I have a lot of questions. <laughs> so the first interpretation is that she Juliet is upset because she realizes that everything her friend was saying was true. He wasn't going crazy.、Mm. He what he didn't have Capgras syndrome where he thought his son was replaced by an imposter. Ah,、oh, the、I、son、see. was replaced, and they don't know how they got this baby. And a lot of people think that another interpretation is that Sigrid has Manchowsen or whatever by proxy. She has a different form of it. So the reason that people interpret that as the ending is even when Julieta is looking through this abandoned little house that they live in,、yeah. it's all hooked up to like more and more air filters and purifiers, and、mm-hmm. they've got light dimmers and stuff. And so it seems that Sigrid gets off on maybe making her child sick so that she would be the one to fix it. It's weird because when I looked into it, majority of the cases like this, the mom or the caretaker likes taking them to a hospital. But、yeah. Sigrid is a medical professional; she's a biologist. She's you know kind of in the medical field, you know. And so it seemed that she wanted to have this control of my baby is going to get sick, but I'm going to make it better. And then there's a deeper layer to that. A lot of people who suffered from PTSD were doing write ups on like Reddit about it, right? And they were talking about it, and it's like an open discussion. And they were saying how maybe it could stem from her miscarriage. And so, if you make something bad happen, and you have the solution for that,、mm-hmm. you feel like nothing bad can happen. Does that make sense?、Mm-hmm. If I'm so busy、uh, making Mango sick with an illness that I know I can cure, then I probably won't feel like Mango's gonna get sick on her own because I'm already making her sick. Okay, that doesn't make it, but okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like a you know, okay, a broad analysis. Now the second analysis of this is that because she had so many books on embryos and books on just very creepy stuff in her lab, some people think that maybe there is a clone involved,、uh. where there was someone that was replaced. So maybe they have the clone, and this is the real Henrik with Sigrid,、uh-huh. or maybe Sigrid has the clone. That、yeah. I don't know because Julia's or Julietta's face was one that was just sheer shock and pain. Uh, And so you're left with that as the ending. So a lot of people think, okay, maybe it was a clone, or maybe they kidnapped someone from an orphanage, and that's why Julieta is shocked because who the hell is that baby she's taking care of?、Right. Is someone missing a baby? And then the third thing is, some people believe that she had twins and was somehow able to hide that from her husband. Oh yeah. And wanted to get rid of the husband, and so she sacrificed one of the twins for it. And then <sighs> another really strange theory is that there's no baby. Okay. That、continue. it's a recording, and she's like Sigrid is talking to a recording. And why is that possible? Because probably the traumatic stress of you know having murdered your husband and baby daddy, and then having to run away, and the kid's not with you. But the dad had a response in the lab saying, "My son." Yeah. So I mean, it's just all a lot of different interpretations. So by the、mm-hmm. surface, it seems like there was an extra baby. Somehow, yeah. Yeah. And that's why she was so shook at the、mm-hmm. end. I see. Kind it's、of. like one of those eerie movies、mm. where there's not a crazy plot twist,、mm-hmm. but something about it is just so、yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's very uncomfortable to think about all of that. Yeah. Like the mom would not let the kid leave the house. Yeah. And she's that crazy paranoid about air filters.、Why、I mean, I'm、that? pretty passionate about air filters, but this lady crazy. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. What made her that way, right? Probably her miscarriage is what、oh. all the analysis say. I've never had. Yeah. So I wouldn't know personally, but I know a lot of women had, and I do hear that it does definitely mess with you. 
But obviously, they're not going to end up like Sigrid because this is a movie and it's really twisted. Yeah. But maybe she just, I don't know. It's just so strange. The, the main two interpretations I've seen is either a kidnapped baby to get rid of her husband or it's that she has Manchazen by proxy syndrome. Uh-huh. So it's just that she wants to control the baby and make it sick and then make it better again because she likes the feeling of making the kid better okay. again. That kind of makes sense. And, and she's yeah. willing to get rid of the husband yeah. to achieve that. Yeah, because a lot of the times this type of syndrome doesn't do well with couples. Mm. Because imagine, like, you know, you have another person looking out, you have another person to talk to a doctor. I think it'd be very incredibly difficult for her to keep making her son sick if the mm-hmm. husband was around. And so it seemed that maybe she felt a motherly boost whenever her kid was sick uh. and she would heal the kid. Uh, so it, it gives her control feeling like hey I, you know i'm not gonna lose this kid because i keep saving this kid uh, to the point where she justifies making the kid sick because the only time you really see the kid in the movie itself is the one time it's sleeping on her chest when all of the friends come and yeah. then all the other times it's crying or it has a fever you know so it's kind of like huh Okay, that makes sense. Something weird's going on, you know? Yeah. Or maybe the kid's just really annoying. You don't know until the end. Yeah, but everyone, including the court system, everybody believed that he just had Capgras syndrome. I see. Where he thought that the son was a imposter. That's what, who he was drawing to, to yeah. face. Mm-hmm. Wow. Let me know in the comments, what are your thoughts on this case? It's kind of a weird, thick one, a uh, movie. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of a weird one. I would say probably watch it when you're not home alone. (laughs) It's got a lot of ambiance to it. All right, guys, that's going to be it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.